Good morning. Welcome to worship at and with Trinity Lutheran Church on the third Sunday of the Epiphany season. Just in case some of you are feeling air moving, the air conditioning is not on, but the fans are on to keep the air moving, to keep all of us safe. So we're not crazy. We're not air conditioning you today. If you are watching worship from home today, you are welcome to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion when you see us receive it here in the sanctuary. Everyone here in the sanctuary has the option of staying in their seats to receive communion or of coming up to the altar rail. If you plan to stay where you are, you need one of those paper bags that contains the bread and wine or bread and juice that you will receive. If you plan to come to the altar rail, make sure you stop at one of these tables to get the bread and wine or the bread and juice, which is clearly marked. The annual meeting of this congregation will take place next Sunday, January 30th, right after worship, either in this room or in the fellowship hall, whichever one is going to allow for people to fully participate over their computers from home if they can't join us here in the building. So we'll be testing that out this week, and you'll figure out where the meeting is next week. One of the things that will be voted on at that meeting is the revised wording of our statement of welcome, which allows us to be a reconciling in Christ congregation. So next week, I will be asking you to affirm that we are a community that welcomes and advocates for all of God's children, that actively works for racial equity and economic justice, and that honors the full spectrum of gender, sexual orientation, gender identification, and expression. Every Wednesday at 9 a.m., people from this congregation gather for breakfast at the Copper Kitchen on Central Avenue at 56th Street South. We have an online Bible study that meets on Thursdays at 2 p.m., and right now we're looking at the final chapters of the book of Isaiah. We don't pass an offering plate anymore, but there is one out in the narthex, the entrance area of the church, where you can put financial gifts. Whether you are here or at home, you can use a smartphone and our QR code to make a donation on our website. You can also mail a check to the church or stop by in person to make a contribution our ministry. The altar flowers are given by Carol Bertaluzzi in honor of her father Bert and in honor of his birthday this week. This week we're also celebrating the birthday of Lisa Valentine. Is anybody else celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this week? Okay. The song that we're going to sing um, just before communion, the offering hymn. I'm not sure what page that's on in your bulletin. We learned it a couple of weeks ago, so it's back this week to reinforce, but we just thought we'd kind of remind you of how it goes before we try to sing it together. What page number is that in? Page seven and eight. Six. Page six, seven, and eight, because every verse needs its own music for this hymn, but. Verses 1, 2, 4, and 5 are pretty much the same exact music. Verse 3 has completely different music, just to keep you on your toes. So let's just sing through verse 1 and verse 3 together, just to kind of remind ourselves how this one goes. <laughs> Oh, are there any other announcements that need to be made? 
I invite you to take a moment of quiet to prepare yourself for today's worship. And as you are able to do so, and as it is comfortable to do so, I invite you to stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory. We have rejected your word when it made us people ourselves. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, and lead us, that we may reflect your love for all creation. Rejoice in this good news. In Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and you are adopted into the household of Christ. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Today's readings explore the relationship between words that are written and words that are spoken and heard. From the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, we hear about the written words of Scripture being proclaimed so that people can hear them and being interpreted so that people can understand them. Today's psalm compares God's written words of instruction and guidance to the sun, which brings light and warmth to the whole planet. The first letter to the Corinthians reminds us that what we might say about ourselves or what is said about us by other people isn't as important as what God has to say about us. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus proclaims and interprets the words of Scripture in his hometown congregation. Let us pray. Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
The good news of God's love according to Luke. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. In the beginning was the spoken word. Long before words were chiseled into clay tablets or scribbled onto woven reeds, people were having experiences of God and speaking to one another about them. The religions of the world may be grounded in written texts, but the faith that has inspired those religions is grounded in the spoken word. The ancient Jewish religion arose from the stories that people told one another about God. Stories about their experiences, stories about their ancestors, stories that answered questions like, why is there a pillar of salt in that devastated wasteland east of the Dead Sea? It took a long time for those stories to be written down. At first, they were only shared by word of mouth. Parents told them to their children. Wise elders would share them with the whole village on special days. People would have mystical experiences that they could not explain. They searched for answers by talking to others about what had happened to them. Faith was nurtured as people talked to one another about God. Forms of writing were created, but only a small fraction of the people could read or write. At some point, the stories and poems and prayers started being written down. That was both good and bad. The words were preserved, but the words lost some of their power. Spoken words have a kind of life that written words don't have. Memorized words can change as one voice passes them on to another. Stories are flexible and can be adapted to fit a particular situation by the person who is telling them. When the words get written down, they become fixed in one form. There's a danger of worshiping the words instead of the God who inspires them. It becomes harder to look at a particular text and imagine how it could be applied to you and to your situation. And books can always be destroyed or just lost. Fahrenheit 451 is a novel about book burning. At the 
end of the book, we learn that some people have dedicated themselves to memorizing all the words of a particular book so that it can be preserved. The Bible contains a story from about 600 years before the birth of Jesus in which the Jerusalem temple is being renovated and a written copy of the ancient Jewish laws is discovered. According to this story, the people had forgotten that there was a written book of the law. Their religion hadn't died out, and they still shared their faith with one another, but they had no idea that God had given them written guidance, not only about worship, but about things like owning property and taking care of the poor. Guidance that hadn't been followed for decades, maybe even centuries. We hear about a similar situation in today's reading from the book of Nehemiah. Now, the book of Nehemiah never existed as stories told around a campfire. This is an official written document created at a specific moment in history, and we know this because a big chunk of the book is just names. Lists of names of all the people who made a difficult journey from their exile in Babylon back to their homeland in Judah to rebuild houses and reestablish farms and vineyards to start work on a new temple to replace the one that had been destroyed, to reestablish a society and a culture and an economy. Once they got all those things up and running, the people then wanted to get their faith and their religion back on a firm footing. So they gathered in a public place and asked a priest named Ezra to read to them the book of the law of Moses. We don't know exactly what book this was, but Ezra read from it for hours. The people stood for hours listening and attentive. Most could understand what Ezra was reading, but some people needed help. While Ezra read the original words of the book, some other scholars who stood on either side of him, whose names fortunately were left out in today's reading, they offered their interpretation. They were the ones who gave the sense of what Ezra was reciting so that the people understood the reading. These interpreters clarified and contextualized the ancient words so that they could be understood in the people's current situation. At the end of the day, the people were encouraged to celebrate. They now had access to God's joy and God's strength because they could hear and understand God's words of guidance and truth. In today's reading from the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus visits his hometown synagogue, because he already has a reputation as a scholar and a teacher, he is invited to read and to interpret scripture during a worship service. According to the ancient custom, he stands when he reads from God's word, and then he sits down in front of the congregation to offer his interpretation of that word. He's allowed to choose whatever he wants to read from the book of the prophet Isaiah. He chooses a passage from the last part of the book, the part that we're discussing in our Thursday afternoon Bible study, the part of the book written in about the same time as the book of Nehemiah. It's a message of comfort and encouragement for traumatized people trying to make a fresh start in a precarious situation. 
even though they have been released from Babylon, the prophet recognizes that he is called to minister to those still experiencing captivity and oppression, because those things exist in every society and in every age. In the time of Jesus, the people were again experiencing poverty and oppression at the hands of the Roman Empire. They were waiting for a promised Messiah who would set them free. Jesus is that promised Savior, but the salvation he's offering is something far greater. It is a deliverance from all oppression, all fear, all hatred, and all shame. It is the healing of our blindness to the truth of God's love. It is the help and wholeness that are found when we follow him in offering our own self-sacrificing love. And so, when Jesus sits down to offer his teaching and his interpretation, and the eyes of every person in the synagogue are fixed on him with breathless anticipation, he talks about the words that are written on the page and how those words come to life. He doesn't say, finally, in the year 30-something A.D., this scripture is fulfilled when I read it. He says that today, and on every today of human history, the scripture is fulfilled not in the reading of it, but in the hearing of it. The words come back to life when they are spoken and listened to and responded to. The words are alive when they create a relationship between people of faith, when people enter into discussion and dialogue about the Word of God. The words have value even when we sit in isolation and read them to ourselves. The words come alive when we share them with one another. In the beginning was the spoken word, and to this very day, it is our spoken words about God moving and active in our lives that offer the food that nourishes and nurtures our faith in God. The first letter to the Corinthians proclaims that we are the body of Christ. Just as Jesus interpreted the ancient words of God in his own words and actions and choices, we interpret the words of God to our community in this time of uncertainty and confusion. We are blessed with a diversity of spiritual gifts so that we can offer the living presence of God to one another and to our community. Every one of us, no matter what we may think of ourselves or what others may say about us, every one of us has a vital role to play in the work of the body of Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the Word continues to become flesh in our words and actions and choices. Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that each one of us can pray, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Among us, 
also speaking to each other voices of hatred and fear so that we have <coughs> one God, God of grace. Anoint us with your spirit, so that we may bring hope and justice for people living in poverty and living under oppression. We pray for those who are sick or suffering in any way, especially Bill Bible, Roy Stu, Craig Bauer, and all those who are before you now. God of grace. Glorify us to be the body of Christ in this place. Empower us to freely welcome and deeply value each person who enters into community with us. God of grace. We remember the saints who now enjoy the fulfillment of your promise. Keep us in fellowship with them and bring us together in your everlasting glory. God of grace. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let's look for ways to share signs of that peace with one another and with all the people in such desperate need of peace. Give thanks to the Lord our 
merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him as your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Despite any forces that try to separate us or isolate us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are united as one living body as we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Welcome to God's table, where there is room enough for all. Amen. Please be seated. If you're staying in your place for communion, you can tear open that white paper bag and get out a little kit that contains the bread and the wine. As you open up the bread and receive it, it is the body of Christ given for you. And then as you open up the wine or juice, it is the blood of Christ shed for you.
for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthen with the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you're able to do so, I invite you to stand to receive God's blessing. May God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name, bless all of your journeys today and forever. Amen. Thanks, Jesus, for God.